Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start off with a verse that was asked to read before we begin. It's Jeremiah 22, verse 13 to 16. It says, Woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upper rooms without justice, who uses his neighbor's service without pay and does not give his wages. Who says, I will build myself a roomy house with spacious upper rooms and cut out its windows, paneling it with cedar and painting bright red? Do you become a king because you are com- competing in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do righteousness? Then it was well with him. He plead the cause of the afflicted and needy. Then it was well. Is not that what it means to know me, declares the Lord. My name is uh, Jesse Sidirgo. I am I'm a new faculty here in the seminary, actually. Um, I, I'm the director of the Church in the City MDiv program, and I just started in July. And to be honest, I would not be here today uh, working here um, if it wasn't uh, for our speaker, uh, Dr. Rick Tobias. Um, he's been a pretty pivotal person in helping me to articulate uh, a theology around poverty and those on the margins. And I, I don't tend to compliment Rick uh, face-to-face very often, uh, so this is going to be a bit challenging, so we'll see how I can get through this. Uh, when, I, when I came, I used to work at Young Street Mission before I came here. Uh, I, I, I worked at Young Street Mission for seven years, and actually when I got there, I didn't know much about, about Rick. Um, I vaguely knew he was an influential figure in the uh, urban ministry world, but I didn't know the weight of his significance uh, or impact to the city. Um, compliments coming soon. It's coming. Um, I, I had no idea, actually, of his accolades. I didn't know of his honorary degrees. Um, I didn't know uh, of his incredible, uh, innovative contributions to the social sector. Um, but after getting caught up by my coworkers and getting to know them a little bit, and uh, some sector leaders over the past few years working in the field, and hearing all these stories about Rick and getting... Um, caught up on his leg, great legacy that he has in this field, um, as, after hearing all those things, oddly enough, what stands out to me uh, most um, is not his reputation, actually, or his past accomplishments. Um, but actually, I, after getting to know him a lot, it's, it's actually his, um, his present discernment uh, and often prophetic intuitions of things to come. I had the honor of being mentored by Rick over the past few years, and Rick, it gives me a lot of honor to be able to uh, introduce you today. And Rick has given a lot of younger, you know, whippersnappers like me um, a a platform to be able to lead on and and a stage to be able to articulate things. And he's allowed me to teach in his classes here at Tyndale, um, allowed me to negotiate a lot of things with leadership. And uh, he truly is a leader who genuinely wants the next generation to exceed his own. And so he reminds me um, of the words of A.W. Tozer when he says that the meek man cares not who is greater than he, for he has decided long ago that the esteem of the world is not worth his effort. Today I want to introduce Rick as the kind of man who resembles this kind of meekness that Tozer describes and who seems to embody this fearlessness in his leadership, a leadership that is not of self-preservation uh, or scarcity, but one of generosity, uh, empowerment, and release. So would you mind coming and introducing and giving him a hand uh, as Dr. Rick Tobias comes forward? Well, I'm getting my computer up because there is no Rick Tobias without the computer. Um, I'm reminded that Dr. Uh, Eugene Rivers uh, from Boston used to say, don't smoke your own PR, it's a bad high. So greetings. Greetings to those of you who are here. Gary, particularly greetings to you. 
Um, Gary's been part of my life since probably the early to mid 80s. Um, I'll need to explain this, but we were bums together. And, uh, and, and by that, I don't mean we hung out on, on beaches. We belonged to a group of downtown uh, urban workers who called themselves Baptist Urban Ministers or whatever, and they hyphenated or shortened to bums. Um, he was also involved in the development of something called, uh, uh, BAP, called BUILD. And again, it was a Baptist program to train urban leadership. When that group used to gather, there were people in that group who, to me, were incredibly smart. Uh, Gary was one of them. Al Roxborough was another. Um, and I used to remember thinking, if I can just catch their wake and hang on, then maybe I'll be okay, because they seemed to me the smartest people I knew. I don't know that I ever caught their wake, but what I do know is that for many, many years, uh, Gary has been nothing but supportive. And so, Gary, please hear that uh, I know you as a man of grace, and uh, and I know you as a man who, um, oh, the words go, encouragement, encourager, and and, uh, and it's good to be here today on on this chapel that honors you. I also want to thank Tyndale. They have let me teach here for over 30 years. I've had the wonderful opportunity of kind of balancing out Young Street Mission in Tyndale. And they kind of feed each other and they both kind of enrich me. And during those 30 years, the school has been amazing. Like... And by amazing, now you got to get to define amazing in my world. They didn't check up on me very much. Like I could have been doing almost anything in those classes. Who, who would ever know? Um, the administration was supportive. Um, and, and so the school, that institution that is Young Street Mission, or I'm sorry, that is Tyndale. Thank you. Um, and to students who quite bluntly gave up electives. Uh, I only taught electives here. And so students who took my course or courses had to surrender one of their precious electives. And, uh, and I'm very grateful to them for that. Also welcome to my wife Cheris and my son Jeremy. Obviously I couldn't be more thrilled than to have them here. Welcome to those of you who are not normally at Tyndale Chapel. Um, my boss Angie Peters is here somewhere. And I say that with great love because I could not respect her uh, and esteem her more. And to the last group in the world that I actually expected to be here, motorcycle group called Los Silverados. And, um, and they were involved in the support and, and, and announcement and proclamation of the mission for years. And, uh, and they are here in numbers. And so to the Silverados, uh, thank you. And finally, to, obviously, the faculty and staff, welcome to you as well. For 45 years, I have been privileged to be part of the church's growing response uh, to poverty, its compassionate response to poverty. And by compassionate response or ministry, I mean all the things the church has done to bring relief from and an end to uh, various types of poverty. While there is always more that we could do, always more that we could have done, it is beyond question that the church's care for the poor over the past generation has grown significantly. Across this country, literally dozens, if not hundreds, if indeed not thousands, of Christian workers have not just been serving in communities of poverty, but they've been doing their own theology and they've been teaching and preaching um, about the church's responsibility to give back and care for the poor. Today, the church and its missions are the number two provider of care for the poor in Canada. Only the government provides more services and care for the poor than the church. 
Now, it wasn't always that way. <clears throat> I remember in the early days when compassionate ministries were seen as being somewhat suspicious and viewed with suspicion by the church. I remember when I was told, just preach Jesus and salvation and all would be well. I remember when services to the poor were simply bait on an evangelistic cook because we cared more actually about evangelism than we cared about people. I remember being told that poverty was the exclusive responsibility of the poor. They were sinners, they were lazy, they were authors of their own condition. That incidentally is the polar opposite to the Bible's teaching. I remember when we were so high and mighty that we often destroyed human dignity even as we, in quotes, served people in need. We've come far, come a long way. Increasingly, ministries to low-income and marginalized people are compassion-based, and there is an understanding that those things that lead to poverty are often beyond the control of the poor. That, incidentally, is the word of the Lord. After 45 years, I've come to believe a number of things. First, I believe that you cannot claim to be a biblical Christian or a Bible-believing Christian and not take seriously the plight of the poor. Obviously, you can claim faith. Obviously, you can claim to be Christian. But we, particularly in the tradition of the seminary, have been kind of people of the book. And we have claimed a great love for the book. And yet we have denied a very significant piece of its message. And you cannot claim to be Bible-believing and deny the plight of the poor. The CEV, uh, Poverty and Justice Bible, literally identifies over 2,000 references to poverty and justice in the scripture. It's a major body of biblical literature. The Bible's teaching of the poor, about the poor, is not the fringe message that the church, that our schools, our seminaries, our colleges, our denominations have made it out to be. In fact, our responsibility to engage and care for the poor is one of the most central themes in scripture. Jesus would launch his ministry by quoting Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed. He has sent me to bandage the crushed and the broken, to proclaim liberty to those who are ca taken captive, and freedom to those bound and taken prisoner. It takes work to deny the Bible's message about poverty and justice. The second thing I've come to believe over the years is that compassion and a compassionate response to poverty is not enough. Relief and care uh, for people's needs was never intended to be the end of the story. Often, as we, the church, have served the poor, it has been true that our only intended end was to deliver relief. In fact, it is only the first step of our response. Angie Peters, the director of Young Street Mission, often talks about the relief programs the mission does, literally as being rampways or exit ways that lead people on to, uh, to highways that allow them to move on with their life. The end is not to make the poor comfortable in their poverty, but to help them move on with their lives and to cause them to have control over their lives. Again, I want to be careful. This is not to say that ministries of compassion are invalid or coming to an end. In fact, they will be a big part of what we will need to do for the next generation. No question. My third reaction as I reflect on the years is that justice must be central. If the task of my generation was to encourage the church to be compassionate, and to multiply its compassionate responses. The task of the emerging generation will be, be to proclaim justice. And in fact, they have already begun to do that. 
Our task as leaders, as elders, is simply to make the way easy for them, to enable and empower them. Um, I believed this when I was 30, and I believe it now that I'm almost 70. If you're old, either help the next generation or get out of the way. Just get out of the way and let them do what they need to do. The task of the generation ahead is much more difficult than my task. Justice is harder than compassion. It's a lot harder than, than compassion. Dom Helder Camara, a South American pastor, said, when I feed the people, when I, when I feed the poor, people call me a saint. When I ask why the poor are poor, people call me a communist. To move beyond compassion towards justice may cost us. I know workers and pastors who have been told very bluntly to go back and tend their pastorate, to get out of the social sector, for, for lack of a better term. I know donors who have cut off their funding to agencies because those agencies began to voice their concern that justice was required in the land. During the years, I've spent a lot of, year, a lot of time studying and reflecting about poverty and compassion, speaking about poverty and compassion. And if I were to start over again today, if today was the first day of my ministry career, I would be committing myself to the study of justice and the study of injustice. I believe there are something like 900 scriptures that talk about justice, 900. And I haven't been able to verify this, but in my own study and reading, I have found over 40 different Greek and Hebrew words that appear over 1,500 times that speak about injustice, oppression, victimization, bondage, slavery, all of that nasty stuff. 1,500 times. That in itself is a whole volume of work worthy of further reflection and study. Justice asks the Chimera question, why are the poor poor? But it also asks, who are the poor? How do the poor get justice? What is justice? And perhaps the most basic biblical response to what justice is, is found in Deuteronomy 15.4, when it says literally that you can build a nation in which there is no poverty. That's justice, a nation in which there is no poverty. Justice looks like the diminishment of poverty, particularly chronic poverty. Our failure to meet that standard shows up only literally seven verses later in Deuteronomy when God says, the poor will be with you always, and then says, because you won't keep my laws. Not that it's inevitable. The ending of poverty biblically is not impossible. We choose not to end poverty. We choose not to diminish poverty. As a nation, we get the level of poverty that we're comfortable with, what we can tolerate. And we tolerate an awful lot. The scripture today is from Jeremiah 22. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I first noticed it because it talked about King Josiah eating and drinking. And when I read that, I began to realize that, why would you even point out the fact that the king ate and drank? Of course he ate and drank. And I began to realize that it meant that King Josiah banqueted, he partied. Maybe he even ate a little too much and drank a little too much. You can wonder why I'm fascinated with that. The passage is also Jeremiah's rebuke of Jehoiakim because Jehoiakim was an evil, oppressive king who fed off and benefited from the misery of his people. It's also a blessing or an anointing of Josiah. And Josiah may have been the best king Israel ever had. He came to the throne at age eight. He stayed till he was about 39. He led a religious awakening. He rebuilt the temple and introduced or reintroduced to the people of Israel, the people of Judah, biblical worship. He kicked out all the false gods. He's a good king and leader. 
And this passage in particular says that Josiah was known because he implemented justice and he was himself just. The two words used there are, are strong words in Old Testament literature. The first is misbot, and it's used over 400 times in the Bible. And, it, and I need to oversimplify a bit, but essentially it refers to systemic or institutional justice. It's the justice you instill in a nation. It's about fair laws fairly administered to all the people. It's about the process that works to ensure that all the goods and all the services and all the privileges of the nation are for all the people. Justice is about treating people right on a corporate or national level. And Josiah, it says, didn't just talk about it. He didn't form a standing committee or a task force. Josiah, it says, did justice, did it. But it also says he was a personally just man Sadak. Sadak is used literally in its various forms over 500 times in, in the Old Testament. We often translate it righteousness. I think we like that word righteous because it's so vague. What is it? But in fact, it is best translated just. And the scripture intends to say not that Josiah was somehow vaguely righteous. It intends to say he was a just man. And perhaps the difference between Mishpat, this institutional justice, and Sadak is that Sadak is personal. It's in your face, it touches. It's about me or you actually engaging issues. It's about you and me and Josiah uh, living justly. It's about living a life of right relationships. It's about personal investment in people. It particularly is about investment as it relates to relationships with the poor. It's charitable, it's compassionate. It's about treating people with dignity and respect. Josiah was just. And so the scripture says of him, he did justice and he was just. But then it goes on. It says he pleaded the cause of the oppressed and the dependent. It's a legal term. He pleaded. He didn't just do stuff, but after he did stuff, he used the stuff he did as a platform to stand in front of people and say, this is what we need to be about. He pled the cause as if he was standing in front of a court of law, saying to the, saying to the people who run the land, him, saying to the people of the land, this is how we should live. This is what life is like for people trapped on the wrong side of the divide. He pled the cause. He was an advocate. <clears throat> he was an advocate for the, for the poor. Specifically, and you lose so much in English translation, it says in the passage that, that he was an advocate for the oppressed and the dependent the oppressed poor and the dependent poor. Those two words are used together 25 times in the Old Testament. And I've come to believe that when the Old Testament puts those two words together, it really means to say all the poor, the sum total, from those who are oppressed to those who are dependent, all the poor, he pled for them. For the widows, for the orphans, for the aliens, for the poor, for the people who have been called the quartet of the vulnerable. But the cause of the Ani, those who have been on the receiving end of systematic oppression, been on the receiving end of things like the doctrine of discovery, carding, no clean water, residential schools, abusive systems such as orphanages, inequity and in education and other national services. But Ani is also about personal oppression. It's about women who are battered, children who are abused, people who get mugged in back alleys, children who are bullied in schools. They are the oppressed. And it's about the Ebion on the other end, the welfare recipient, the beggar in the doorway, the person who's couch surfing, 
there, the Ebion. And between them are a whole group of people, the Dao. The Dao are the infirm, the invalid, the psychiatric consumers who dwell on our streets, the disabled. It's about the Rahabi. The Rahabi are those who famish. In an agricultural society, they famish because the ground is not growing. In a city like Toronto, they famish because they have no jobs or because the jobs pay a non-living wage. And you know that a non-living wage is just another form of slavery. And we all benefit from the fact that people in the city work 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, and don't make enough money to live on. Well, we have more billionaires in Canada than ever. He played the cause of the roar, the rush, the dispossessed, those who have lost their stakehold, First Nations peoples who had their land taken from them and never got to experience a jubilee, African blacks who didn't have their land taken from them but in fact were taken from their land, victims of human trafficking, people who have essentially been taken from their place and their space. And then we come back to the Evian. I used to think, and if any of you have studied with me, you've heard me say this. I used to think that the Evian was just another kind of poverty. There, there, there was the oppressed, there was the sick, there was, and then there were the Evian, the dependent. The past couple of years, I've changed my thinking. I think Evian, dependency, is the end of poverty. You get oppressed, you get sick, you get beat up, you get excluded, you get cut off from your land, you get taken from your land. And all these things happen to you until the point where you are so beaten down that the only hope that exists in you is that somebody will reach out and help you. You're dependent. I believe Ebion is the Old Testament equivalent to poverty of spirit. New Testament, we do great theologies around poverty of spirit. They're all terrible. Poverty of spirit is about coming to the end of your rope. And the Ebion have come to the end of their rope. Josiah pled for all of them. That's what he did. He pled their cause. I'm going to skip a couple of things because I can see we're out of time. Jeremiah ends with these words. He says to the people of Israel who will be reading this, your father, the king, Josiah, pled the cause of the poorest of the poor. And then he says, and he puts this in the mouth of God. He doesn't say it in his own word. He puts it in the mouth of God. He says, is this not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. To plead the cause of the poor, to plead the cause of the oppressed, to plead the cause of the dependent. Is this not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. That's a strong saying. That's a strong saying. And as if Jeremiah says through the voice of God to the people of Israel, how can you claim to be the people of God? How can you claim to know God? and not plead the cause of the poor. And I believe he would say to the church, how dare us claim to know God and not care about poverty and not care about justice. And I believe he would say to each of us as individuals, how do we claim to be so holy, so high, so mighty, so spiritual and not care about the poor? Is this not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. And I'm supposed to close in prayer. God, may we leave this place with a heart for you 
with a heart for others. And may we leave this place with your peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. To my friends who are here, thank you.